This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. The title given for this panel is Building Capabilities, and uh, we would like to remind our audience that is uh, viewing via the internet to please go ahead and send in your questions to the panelists at usmexucsd at twitter.com or via email at mmf2012 at ucsd.edu. And we will also entertain some questions from the audience depending on how much time we have at the end. We'll try to keep things moving. Um, let me begin by introducing our panelists. Gabriela Enrique Gonzalez is founder of Prospera, a company developing innovative ways to help female-led micro-enterprises grow as a way to become sustainable sources of employment opportunities and to increase equality, diversity, and fairness. And to her right, we have Beatriz Magaloni is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Stanford University. Her work studies elections and the process by which democratization can empower poor citizens. And to her right, we have Monica Tapia, is the founder and executive director of Alternativas y Capacidades, a capacity building organization that aims to improve the ties between civil society organizations and their private donors in order to maximize the impact of their work. So let me welcome all of you, and we'll get started first with Gabriela. The stories we tell about ourselves define who we are. The stories we tell about each other define how we interact and the possibilities we see. The stories of our collectiveness, our collective stories, define our future. Uh, and this is, uh, in a way, what I want to talk to you about. Uh, I would like to share with you my story, how I came about to start Prospera, and uh, how I believe the connection among each other, and uh, by working collaboratively, we can help Mexico move forward. So uh, this is how I learned to give back. At a very early age, of course, uh, growing up in Mexico in a Catholic country, um, I was told that um, it was my responsibility to help others. It was my responsibility in, uh, in a way, uh, sort of the responsibility Jesus was giving us to, to help the, when, the ones that were uh, less fortunate, the ones that were uh, poor. So um, I've always wanted to contribute. I've always wanted to you know, make myself very useful to my world, to my country, and to others. So I started really very early age uh, trying to figure out how to do this. And uh, this is my first encounter to poverty. I learned that uh, poor people were begging. I learned that poor people were uh, really extending their hands and uh, we needed to help them. And this really confused me. I also learned that uh, poverty meant devastation that poverty really meant lack of resources and uh, a lot of suffering, hopelessness, loneliness. And this really made me really sad and, again, angry, uh, frustrated, overwhelmed. I did really didn't know what to do, but I still wanted to contribute. I just didn't know how. I felt guilty for everything I had, for my relative wealth, respect to all the poor people I was seeing in my country. I felt re really uncomfortable for uh, living in such an unequal country, uh, really uncomfortable for also being a woman and being treated in many ways as a minority, and I didn't know what to do. 
Um, then, you know, I kept, uh, in a way, I kept uh, trying to contribute, figuring out again what to do, but uh, from a place of uh, fear, of discomfort. And uh, this place of trying to give back really gets in the way of uh, what we as human beings crave the most, which is having a connection, which is helping others, which is really existing and contributing in a meaningful way. I learned growing up that uh, people were poor because they were depressed, that people were poor because they were drinking and gambling, and um, that people, uh, there were poor kids in the world because they had irresponsible parents. So I figured, well, probably uh, this is not the way I could contribute. Probably I need to distance myself and I need to be detached and uh, I still can contribute, but you know, from the theory. I went on and studied economics. It was way too theoretical to me. It didn't make too much sense. And then I figured, okay, I'll study political science. Maybe I can contribute that way. And still, I mean, uh, I learned very, very few useful things and it didn't feel right. <laughs> And then I figure, okay, I'll, um, I'll study statistics. I might as well find something where, um, you know, I can contribute in that way. It's applied, it's applied statistic. Econometrics felt, you know, like the, the solution to me. And again, it didn't feel right. Went to study the uh, masters in public policy because I thought that that way I would figure out uh, a model to change the world. Still didn't feel right. But then I had the opportunity to do an internship in the Philippines, in Vietnam and in Cambodia. And then uh, I was able to be exposed to, in a way, what I was craving, the real world, to see what others were doing in terms of poverty alleviation and to also see what, what a different model there could be, what a different ways to look at poverty. And uh, I started looking and realizing that there were solutions, that uh, poverty not always meant devastation, not always meant deprivation and hopelessness. I started, uh, learning from banana growers, how they were courageous entrepreneurs, how they were talented people, how instead of uh, being hopeless, they were resourceful, how uh, creative they were. I learned from rice growers as well, from pineapple growers. I interacted with entrepreneurs and I started seeing, you know, learning about their stories, learning about their happy lives, learning about their dreams. Uh, how important it was to them to acknowledge their work and how proud they felt about uh, others recognizing their effort and their talent. I also learned that there wasn't such a thing as this dichotomy between the poor and the rich, between the wealthy and uh, large corporations and micro entrepreneurs. I also realized and learned that uh, partnerships with large multinationals uh, were possible and that a lot of wealth and prosperity, prosperity could uh, arise from these partnerships. And then, of course, this was enough. I mean, great to see what was happening in uh, Southeast Asia, but I needed to go back to Mexico. I needed to do something in my country and figure out whether this uh, perception of poverty uh, uh, could also change my perception of poverty and my position of guilt and uh, suffering could change. So uh, I went back and I started looking again, looking at these, the same families that made me feel bad before. And I saw hardworking families. I saw more hardworking families. I saw hardworking couples that really were working uh, to bring about a change in their lives. I started noticing the beautiful little details about life-changing stories, how they really were able to prosper with tiny little changes in their daily operations. Um, I saw working moms building their own businesses from scratch, really being proud of what they've done. Um, I saw talented people, creative, again, very resourceful entrepreneurs, discipline, this thing about uh, micro entrepreneurs no knowing, not knowing about accounting was started to feel foreign to me. They really needed to know their accounting because since they're not as profitable as many other uh, or more traditional enterprises, they really need to know where their money goes. Um, they were creating abundance. They were inspired, motivated. They were seeing possibilities where other people didn't see it. What we learned in the process is that uh, not only they were um, real entrepreneurs, but they were willing to partner with us. They were really willing to work on an equal basis. They were willing to train others and to develop new products. And this is where the idea of Prospera came about. This tiny little idea that we can build partnerships with micro entrepreneurs, that there's talent and wealth that is being created here. 
that uh, it's not only money that they need, that they also need networks and support and training and guidance, but that there is talent and there's wealth here. They're also willing to learn from market trends, to mentor others. They are also willing, capable, and able of producing in a sustainable way world-class products. We also learned that people wanted to help them. This idea of uh, Mexicans do not care about Mexico, that we're short-sighted and we really do not, uh, we don't help each other. We learned that it wasn't really true, that there are people that really want to help sometimes. All they don't know is uh, how to do that. Uh, we also found that we can instill and encourage regular people to become entre entrepreneurs, to take action and help others. We're developing the tools for regular citizens to be entrepreneurs and do something, even if it was very little, but do something very concrete and productive for their country. Uh, and then we went on, we figured we were on to something and we went on to build a uh, team of uh, social entrepreneurs. Not a team of a leader and employees, and this I have to thank Carlos, uh, a team of all social entrepreneurs. Since we were dealing with such a complex problem that was way bigger than ourselves, we needed to have every single member of our team to be a social entrepreneur and to really try to look for solutions. Be very uh, aware of the problem we were trying to solve, which is to dignify the self-employed, to make micro-entrepreneurs uh, profitable, to help them participate in uh, mainstream markets, to help them uh, be part of uh, our wealth creation processes. And with that idea in mind, we really, uh, we, we started trying different things. Uh, we started spreading the, world, the word about what we, trying to, what we were trying to do. We were trying all sorts of uh, models of engagement. Some of them worked, some of them really didn't work at all. But uh, what we were committed was uh, to finding a solution to uh, micro-entrepreneurship development. So um, even in spite of uh, all the work and uh, sometimes feeling disappointed, we were really, or we've always been you know, like really focused on our mission and our vision of, uh, of Mexico. Uh, we even started fostering entrepreneurship in unexpected and untraditional places. We started working with uh, kids and teenagers uh, with disabilities and helping them develop their own enterprises. They're still simple enterprises, but they are committed and focused. And they are willing to work as hard as any other person. This, of course, inspired us a lot. A lot. And we started even you know, thinking about new possibilities. What if we could not only build micro-entrepreneurship with uh, people that are already that are already in the market, that are already trying to, uh, to develop their own businesses. But what if we could really build an inclusive supply chain where everything is done by micro-entrepreneurs, where most of uh, these products and uh, most of the work and the, wor the wealth we are creating is made by uh, female entrepreneurs, by all of those that um, are traditionally not, don't traditionally have a place in the, in the labor market. So, so far, what have we done? We've trained more than 3,000 entrepreneurs. We've developed more than 400 products, and we've increased sales in a sustained way of 300% for more than 125 families. We've engaged 200 volunteers to become entrepreneurs, to really to give them the tools to care about Mexico, to do something in a very concrete way, whether they had the time, whether they had an hour, a minute, or a day to work with us, to really care about micro-entrepreneurs and to really be uh, sensitive about why is this important to, for Mexico's growth. Um, what I know for sure, we want balance and harmony more than just growth. Uh, we've learned for the longest time that uh, growth was uh, sort of an end in itself, and I believe that's not true. We, we've had all sorts of monopolies, and, and you know, we've all been exposed to uh, the 2008 crisis. And I don't think, I think we should learn from that experience and try to avoid another too big to fail or uh, some other uh, sort of a unfair bailouts. Um, I also know for sure that we all care about Mexico. I don't need to convince you about that. What I know for sure as well is that we just sometimes need uh, tools. We just need some, somebody to tell us what to do. But the willingness and uh, the motivation to do something is there, which is what's important. So now I'd like to reflect on what do we need to, to do as a, as a society, collectively, to move on, to move from this uh, mediocre growth uh, period of Mexico, to move from this crisis into prosperity. 
we need to move from the false dichotomy of uh, us versus them, of uh, the rich versus the poor. We really need to understand that it's our collective stories, that is uh, by working as a society that we will be able to move forward as a country. We also need to move from domination to harmony. We, the traditional rules of competitions are trying to eliminate the one who's uh, trying to solve a similar problem to us and start thinking more about collaboration. We also really need to, to move from exclusivity to inclusivity. And I don't know, probably in a forum like this it might seem obvious, but it's not really once we go back to Mexico. Um, there is this very much a desire to belong to the selected few, to the boys club, to the ones that went to so-and-so prestigious uh, university. But sometimes we don't realize that it's by including minorities, that, that it's by listening to others, that we will really become uh, a growing and a prosperous country that we will really be able to innovate and solve complex problems. We need to move on, to move from individual success to community success. And then again, it might seem obvious, seem obvious in a forum like this, but in Mexico, what I see on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes it seems more about uh, the person. It's about the, you know, like the sort of a, the acknowledgement of the lonely ranger of the sole entrepreneur than about what they can do for the community. And I believe that the only way for Mexico to move forward is to really start embracing a model of community success. Also, uh, we need to learn how to solve problems in a systemic way. We've uh, all been uh, victims of uh, insecurity in Mexico. We've all seen how, been witnessed how uh, it's been sort of a very big challenge for government to solve. And one of the reasons I believe that it hasn't been solved in a sustained way is because it's, it's not being solved in a systemic way again. It's only trying to be solved, uh, to solve one part of the problem without really seeing that problems are integrated. That you cannot just fight drug organizations or crime organizations without creating jobs, without worrying about inequality, without looking for uh, idle youth. And uh, also, in order for us to move on, I believe that we need to understand that money certainly helps to solve certain problems, but it's just a part of the solution. We need other things. We need we need, again, networks, we need support, and we need guidance. And uh, what I'd like to ask you, uh, after listening to my story, uh, is to start listening to people's stories, to really find inspiration in others, to empower, to take action, and really, um, you are all leaders here, and really start understanding that uh, the new leadership that this world requires is uh, that leadership that grows that uh, really is focused on giving people the tools to, to do what they think is best for them. Um, again, engage with the community. And uh, I'd like to close this intervention by saying that well, leadership, I believe, is great, and we all need leaders. But we, I believe we need more collaboration than leadership. Thank you. Beatrice. So um, if we were having this conversation about how to move Mexico forward 10, 15 years ago, I think we would be listening to very different set of players. Um, we would be listening maybe to bureaucrats, state officials, but it would be really hard to see so many people from the private sector, social entrepreneurs, nonprofit organizations really thinking and moving Mexico forward. Um, and I think this is a really great uh, development that maybe in part has been caused by the re economic reforms and the fact that the state has been reduced. Um, but despite that, I think that we cannot um, have development without state action. And upon listening, to the presentations this morning, I was tempted to ask Gabriel, I didn't have time to see whether we could really delegate the problem to, to him and have all these cities created by his organization and, and that would solve the problem. So I don't know how easy that would be, but the fact of the matter is that societies have not been able to find that technology to live without the state. And I, I have been obsessed with the study of the state 
because on the one hand, I grew up in a country that was authoritarian and that was very evident when I grew up that the institutions and the laws were highly corrupted and the state officials were also highly corrupted. That was part of the reason that I was pushed into studying political science. And the other reason I've been obsessed about the state is because, as I say, I study political science and I think that a lot of the problems of development deal, really deal with the fact that states fail, fail and fail very often fail very often to deliver services, fail very often to, to deliver education, fail very often to deliver security to its citizens. And we can see the state failing in Mexico in many different realms. The one that is most obvious is the, the security aspect. And I have a big project on that, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the positive aspects of the state that I have discovered to my surprise in the, in the research that I've been doing in poor communities in Mexico. So this is in particular, um, focusing in particular in Chiapas and Oaxaca, the two projects that I'm going to be talking about deal with issues of poverty and the role of the state and how I've been you know, surprised to find that the state is actually doing, uh, doing good things and it's actually helping uh, create uh, capability. So just to be clear, I think that the state needs to be somehow there and we really don't know the right balance to provide health, education, basic infrastructure and security. And this is um, the definition that the Mexican government uses. This is the, no the notion of poverty that the Mexican government uses today, which I think is quite interesting. Is, and I'm not going to explain this because it's a complicated measure, but all I want to say about this is that um, we have a multifaceted conception of poverty, and poverty is not only a matter of having um, lack of income or do not finding a job, but it's also a matter of don't having access to education, access to health services, access to security when you grow old, and access to you know, basic housing. So there is interesting measures that the state has created, and, um, and I'm going to talk about reduction of poverty and the role of the state in, that, in those, in those realms, not, not, not in generating income, but in generating better services. And um, again, I'm not, uh, there is some progress, and these are some figures uh, that come from what I just discussed of poverty, and I'm going to focus on the, on the, on the trend of, this is the, extreme, the measure of extreme poverty in Mexico. And it's really defined by basic capabilities. People, the percentage of, of, of the population who don't have access to education, basic education and nutrition and health and, uh, and, and basic uh, housing uh, services. And as you see, there has been some reduction. I mean, there is a huge jump of poverty. 37% of the population by the economic recession in 1996 were extreme poor. And this has you know, been reduced to around um, 13%. So there is a big debate in, in, in the scholarly literature of what has caused that. And I'm going to in part focus on the work I do. And I'm going to try to summarize this uh, very uh, succinctly. I think there has been a huge transformation in the way that poverty reduction uh, takes place in Mexico. And this is the emphasis that I want to bring here, that there has been um, a lot of learning professionalization of the bureaucratic structures in certain bureaucracies. And in particular, I'm, I'm talking about two programs. One is the creation of Progresa Oportunidades, and I wish Santiago Levy was here because I want to share with him what we've learned about Oportunidades and why we think it's working on the ground in Chiapas and Oaxaca. And I'm going to be talking about that in a minute. So that's one of the programs that I'm going to be talking about. And the other is a federal, which is called the FISM, federal, um, it's a um, federal transfer that the municipalities receive for construction of basic infrastructure. And this map, which is a little complicated, it just highlights that there has been a movement in two directions in Mexico in the creation of these new programs, in that the degree of discretion that the government has in, in targeting these, these um, benefits has been reduced, and this has worked for the benefit of the poor on the one hand, and on the other, that there has been a specific consensus and criteria in the laws and in the regulations that the poor have to be targeted. 
This is a fundamental transformation of the way social policies used to be made in the past. So think of the Pronasol pr program, for those of you who remember that program that uh, during the Carlos Salinas era, it was completely different criteria of distribution in which basically there was huge government discretion on whom to target uh, on the one hand, and on the other because of this discretion, we find in our own work that the extreme poor were never really targeted with benefits. It was really in sort of the use of these funds were used politically, and in a way they were targeted uh, to the ben you know to, to those who supported the PRI. This this capacity of, of politicians to use social programs in the benefit of their supporters and to uh, to win votes has been re reduced, and this has created very huge differences on the ground. So this brings me to our study in, in, um, in Mexico. So we, uh, we spent some time um, in Chiapas and Oaxaca working, and we were researching a different program, but I really came to realize how much Oportunidades is transforming the social structures on the ground, and I want to talk about this in a minute. But just before I go into describing what we've seen there, I just want to to explain to you that in, in reality, we, we know from studies, very serious studies, that Oportunidades has had very important effects in improving health, especially in improving health for children, improving nutrition, uh, so mild effects on educational attainment, and I really think that this is a huge failure in Mexico. The education system is not working. But health is really helping. So uh, Oportunidades is really helping the poor in terms of providing better health for their kids, better health services for their kids. As you know, this money is given to women, um, and the condition is that the women have to keep the kids at school, and they have to bring them to regular visits to health clinics. So Oportunidades, and Santiago Levy here was one of the huge visionaries, has been expanded to over 30 countries in the world, and people are really excited about this approach. I also do work in Guatemala, and in Guatemala, this program is not working. So why is it working in Mexico and is not working in Guatemala? And why is it not working in Argentina, which also has a similar problem? This is one of the key questions that I think needs to be answered. And I think that it needs to be answered in the light of this issue that I'm talking about. It's about the state and the implementation and the structure that the state has put in place. So let me tell you what we found in... in, in um, so possible answers to, to why Oportunidades is working. One would be very simply it's just because people have cash in their hands. So you, know, you have more money in your hands. When you face a crisis, you can take your kid to, to a health clinic. And that's it. That would be a very simple. So you wouldn't really need this huge bureaucracy. You only would need to give cash to the poor. Um, and that people have thought, you know, maybe this is the answer, and we just need to get rid of the whole bureaucracy. But I think this is a, this is a wrong answer. The other thing, you know, possible answer is these regular visits that the kids have to go with their moms in order to keep the money, they have to go to the clinic. So it's very, you know, we really don't know exactly what is it that they are receiving, in, not enough information about what exactly is it that the kids are receiving in these health, 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 health clinics, but we know that they have to go and they have to be measured. If the kids are undernourished, they get supplements. So this is happening every month in every locality in Mexico. Uh, so that could be it. And the third one is that also the women are receiving information. You have courses all the time going on in every single locality in Mexico about fertility, about, about all sorts of, of issues. And the women get together in the communities and are discussing. So these possible three answers, I don't have an answer to show you, but I, I'm just going to try to convince you that, that the answer is not only about the cash that the program is transforming the social structures in such fundamental way that it's really fascinating to observe. So this is San Juan Chamula. These are Chamula, uh, and it's a celebration that I assisted to in which the women were receiving titles for you know, finishing primary education. And they were convinced to do that not through, you know, Oportunidades was not giving the money, but it was through the credibility of Oportunidades these women decided to you know, to follow their education at that age, and also the men there. But what was striking was that the whole community when I was there was virtually celebrate, they're together celebrating women. And this is in one of the most uh, sort of sexist, discriminatory places that you can really think of. I've, you know, I've done research there, and really you feel uncomfortable to just go in there as a, as a woman. And the program is in a subtle but very fundamental way changing this 
this, this, this social structure. And I'm going to tell you a story of how that is happening. So empowering women has really become revolutionary in Chiapas. And I'm going to give you just a very clear, there was in February 7 reported there by, by actually La Jornada, but I also discovered this while I was doing the interviews that there was a, 3,000 women came to the you know, municipality of San Juan Chamula to protest against the, the municipal president. This is the first uh, feminist movement that has ever existed in San Juan Chamula. And I thought this was fascinating. And the reason that the women mobilized is because there was in one locality, um, one man for a reason that is not clear to me, it started this rumor that the vocales of Oportunidades had been involved in a, in a corruption scandal. And the, the community, as you might know, you know, they have these very severe you know, sort of rules for sanctioning um, their own members, you know, apprehended this woman together with two other, and they were actually, you know, you know there, were, there was violence and so on. And the rumor spread in the communities, and in less than three hours, there were 3,000 women at the doorsteps of the municipal president, and they were shouting to him that, you know, they, so that they now, you know, that, that they could really bring him down, that they had the power, and actually the president had to, you know, back, back, um, free the people, and then the person who began the scandal had to pay, and I wrote it down in my notes, but it was, first 70,000 pesos to the community because there were all these people who had to take the buses to go to the protest. But then there was also more, uh, more uh, multas or sanctions that he had to do. So it was overall more than 100,000 pesos that he had to pay. This is completely unprecedented. So the social structure for collective action uh, was provided by Oportunidades. And so this is the story I wanted to tell you. I think this is revolutionary, and this is the reason why we start, I, see, I think we're starting to see such a big effect on the program in many different aspects of, of, uh, of poverty. Uh, so why Opportunities is helping empower women? One is because of the cash. The other is because of this structure of leadership. So they select four uh, vocales in each locality, one for security, one for health, one for education, and so on. And these women actually start to become leaders for the community. So I think this is a very important uh, innovation of the program. As I say, this provides structure for collective action. It's not only that there are some leaders in the community, but when they meet to, let's say, go together to take this nutrition course, the women get together and talk to each other. And it has been you know, analyzed that when women get together and they talk to each other, there are just benefits in doing that. So, and in part it's because women get empowered. <laughs> So this is this study in Malawi, no, that shows this. Um, so there is the information aspect, and then um, important thing, okay, so we're all doing all these things, but the state and the state officials, who are federal officials that arrive to these communities, are behind the women. So these are, you know, strong cacique communities, but the state officials, the operadores de oportunidades, are there behind the women. So this is, this is huge to me. I was so excited to see this because I've been going to Chiapas for 20 years, similar, and it was a completely different, uh, different uh, story when I went there so many years ago. So what type of state is required? I, you know, I'm studying violence on the one hand and the north and you know the disaster of the Mexican state in this part. And then I'm there in Oaxaca and Chiapas looking at this the presence, positive presence of the state, I, I'm really like, this is, you know, sort of very paradoxical. A state that has fallen in the law enforcement aspect, but in the poverty reduction, it's quite, in, quite amazing. So what do you need? You need a lot of state capacity, a lot of presence. One is to target the poor, just to know where the poor are, how to target them. That was in part what, you know, Santiago was able to do when he was um, uh, in, in the government. Then monitoring the conditionality. You know, and this is because you want the program to, you know, benefit the children. So who is really keeping the kids at school? Who is going to the clinics? That takes a lot of state action and capacity. Then penetrating these communities, organizing the vocales, selecting these vocales, you know, knowing that the vocales are there to, to you know, solve the problems. Establishing these enlaces, I didn't talk about that, but there is an enlace of the, of the opportunities that is negotiating with the community, okay? Then this is, Crucial. So obviously there is going to be a lot of abuse, abuses because this is, you know, for many of these communities, this is a principal source of cash. Uh, so it's going to be abuses by the husbands who want to, you know, take the money away from the women and, you know, drink it or 
So there is abuses by husbands, abuses by teachers. So this is all the time happening. Teachers who say, okay, if you don't give half of your you know, benefit, then I say you didn't come to, your kids don't come and you lose your benefit. Health providers, huge source of abuse. No? So I heard these stories again and again. So these, these stories in Akantan, when we, women are afraid of doing the papa sm pap smear, their pap smears because they believe you know, they don't want to do it. And the health provider says, I don't write you, you lose your benefits. So I'm going to lie that you do the pap smear, but you give me half of the money. You know? So this is the type of abuse that is happening all the time. And this is going to, I mean, this is the story of the state. This is the story of politics. But the point is to put together a system to control this, this set of abuses. So, um, and so they are interesting. I, I don't have time to talk about those, but the, there is, Women can go and put in an anonymous um, buson, how do you say, like, a, like an envelope, all the uh, complaints, because they're obviously afraid to complain this publicly. They are small communities. They know that if they complain against the teacher, there is going to be consequences. So you can go and actually complain on the side, put these busones or go to other places to complain. And so there is a lot of, you know, sort of, as I say, the, the state and these officials, federal officials that are not involved in the, in the, in the you know, sort of locality are helping the women keep their, keep their benefits. And the last one is obviously insulating the program from political manipulation. This is very difficult to do. So in Chiapas, I was there and they, I hear that they were offering 40,000 pesos for the opportunities officials to campaign on the, you know, campaign for political parties. But listen how different this is. It used to be the case that you could really remove the benefit from the voters and say, if you don't vote for me, you don't get it. So here is very different. Voters still get it. So all the parties you know, are trying to do is to get the oportunidades uh, promoters to say, OK, this is really from the PRI, or this is really from the PAN. No? So it's, it's just trying to you know, bring their voters to their, but it's a very different source of political manipulation. But, but, but still, the temptation is there. So this is this is the the first story of state capacity that I wanted to to to, to talk about, and I, I think that it has had very important uh, transformative effects on these communities. The other is a slightly more complicated one, which is one of decentralized provision of public goods. So we're talking about here, opportunities is a central bureaucracy with all this structure, strong state behind and so on. But then with a reform in 1997 and the creation of this you know, federal transfer, the money for social infrastructure now goes from the federal state, from the federation to the municipalities. There is a federal formula which is a huge innovation that distributes this money according to poverty criteria. So poor municipalities are getting more money. And this is, again, a huge, uh, huge um, improvement with respect to the past where the PRI just gave and, and, and you know, punish and give whomever you know, was in your favor. So that's a very, very important improvement. But once the money arrives to the municipality, the municipal president has huge discretion in terms of how to spend. So, there is all this money arriving to the municipalities, and the municipalities have to create you know, roads, have to deal with the clean water, put, put water, have to build a market, have to repair the sewages, uh, have to put uh, latrinas. So there is all these social infrastructure projects that they can do, and there is a lot of money going to these localities. So there is a lot of temptation to steal this money and there is a lot of opportunity for corruption. And here, as I say, the story is really more complicated because the Mexican democracy has very serious um, problems, I think. Um, one of them being that the municipal presidents cannot get reelected, as you know, so there, there is not a clear accountability linkage with voters, so you can be elected as a municipal president, do whatever you want, and you know that voters are not going to sanction you. So there is a really limit with accountability. The other problem with electoral democracy is that voters are really very misinformed. So I was in Chiapas, and we were talking about the FISM, and they were fascinated by this. They really didn't know that the money was arriving. They really wanted me to you know, tell them how this works, so inform, and they really want Alberto to go and give them a course on FISM. <laughs> but anyway, there is very limited information about this, okay? So 
how do you limit the abuse of municipal presidents and force them to spend the money in a good way? And here we have, I'm going to go to Oaxaca because our findings suggest that Oaxaca because, well, if you can go back to the previous slide, because there is a very nice experiment that we, we can analyze or institutional difference in Oaxaca that we can analyze that relates to the fact that m around 4, 470 municipalities don't use political parties to elect their, their representatives. They use traditional methods of election. And that means that literally parties cannot compete in the local election, uh, but it's really community uh, people who you know, get elected. And these are called usos y costumbres. So you have some localities that in 1995 chose these traditional methods and some localities that have political parties. So what we did is we went and sampled localities and we interviewed people in these communities to see whether there's clear differences in, in, in terms of the patterns of accountability between both. And I have to tell you that there is, there, you know, at least in the political science literature, there has been sort of um, distrust and pessimism about how traditional institutions work, our findings are the opposite. So I'm very excited to present you this because again, we're talking about indigenous communities, very poor communities in which the social capital and the community strength seems to be really important in limiting state abuse and creating better services. So let me just go quickly because I, I don't want to take too much time. Three aspects of usos that I want to emphasize, these, these traditions, one is that they select their leaders according to to their own traditions, normally in an assembly. Normally people who get elected have to have done cargos for the community, which means that they have to serve the community. Um, it varies a lot. So that's a big difference versus the party communities that you know what happens. So there is party competition. and Then there is this cargos and techos, so there is community service. So for example, one of the striking things, we were driving in Oaxaca and then you go to one community and there is recycling and the you know, town is clean. Then you go to another one and it's full of garbage and then you ask, you know, why is it? Why are you circling? And they tell you part of the tech or the cargo is that we have to clean the town on Sundays. So this is in the, in the community ones. And then there is alternative conflict resolution mechanisms. This is, this is fascinating and I could go forever, you know, talking about this picture. But, you know, they, he, this, this man was sanctioned and so he's in jail because he didn't, uh, serve the community and then I asked him, you know, do you mind if I make a picture of you? And then I took a picture and then when I show it to my kid, he says, you know, I, I explained that he's sanctioned because he didn't do his community service and then Nicolas, my son, asked, you know, and why is he smiling? <laughs> so I thought, you know, this is such a good question because Really, if you were in the Cerezo in Chiapas, you would not be smiling, no? Because you know that you would never be out of jail. So he knew that he was going to be out of jail at least in two days, no? So part of the findings that we have, you know, additionally, is that there is less crime in these communities, which is really interesting. But I don't want to talk about that, in, you know, just to finish. So just to highlight the differences in terms of accountability, and I'm, you know, sorry about this. I'm going to read it to you because this is, so the first que question is, have you ever gone to a community assembly? And then there is 89% in those that are governed by parties say, no, I haven't. No, never. I don't know, you know what is this cost. And then 62% in the USOs communities, yes, I've been in an assembly and I you know, know what's been discussed there. Does the municipal president consult people to hear the problems and decide which public works he will realize? No, 62% in parties says no, I never get consulted. In the municipalities by usos, 68% say they, yes, they are consulted about this. And I could go on and on. So there is a huge difference, you know. In general, do you think that the current municipal president governs to service the community or he does not care about people's problems? And then 51% of parties say he doesn't care and then 68% in the USOS one said, no, he cares about us. So it's a completely different story of political representation and I want to finish there. Somebody mentioned in the, in the morning that the strength is really in the community. This, this, this is you know, the big finding for, for us in this, in this set of studies is that um, for the case of local government accountability, having a strong community really is, is essential. How do you get into building a strong community? These are traditions that you know, probably come from colonial times, 
but this is really a crucial puzzle for development. Having a strong community really, really works. And here, I don't know whether the state can create it or not. I mean, this is, this is the reason I, I wanted to ask this um, to the state or someone else, to Gabriel this morning in, in his presentation saying, you know, we're building these communities. Um, so I, I would like to discuss that in the question and answer session. Thank you so much. And our last presentation, Monica Tapia. Um, thank you to Alberto and Manuel for the invitation. And Manuel asked me to talk about something positive about Mexico and something that um, wasn't well known. So, uh, and I work in civil society. I work across, as you'll see, um, lots of organizations and I'd like to start my presentation um, quoting Mario Campos. Mario Campos is the news director of IMER. This is public radio. This is the equivalent of NPR. And he knows the country very well, and he has a very interesting vision. And he says, among the bad news in Mexico, there is a good news. One, it's that civil society is emerging, and it's maturing. And I think that's really true. Um, a lot of civil society where it didn't exist, it's emerging very fast, especially in the border. Um, and also, it's maturing, and I would like to add, and I would like to talk more about this, it's also pushing for structural reforms or political reforms that are really needed in the country. And I really like the presentation in the morning of the economists talking, okay, this is economics and this is why Mexico is not growing, the rest is politics and they didn't talk much about that. But I'd like to talk about what's really reform and political reform in Mexico. Um, I'll touch a little bit on these five reforms. The first three, I'll explain them a bit. One is a political representation reform. Uh, the second one is rule of law reforms. Third is quality of education. And then very briefly on consumers' rights and sustainable cities planning. Uh, so let's start about political representation. And you'll probably know that uh, Mexican democracy came in, but we as citizens feel very unrepresented by politicians. Uh, there's very little accountability uh, on, on their part. And in the last three years, uh, an interesting idea came in. It came through um, social media and political activists called the voto nulo, the no vote. I don't know if you've heard about this. Um, in 2009 elections, around two million people annulled their vote, voto nulo. This was around 5% of the result election. In some cities, it, it was as large as 12%. So you can really get somebody elected with that difference in Mexico. And how that came about, it was really a small group of political activists through using Twitter, Facebook for the first time in Mexico. Uh, so this was really important. But this group of activists did not stop there. It, um, they organized in a small, loose network called ANCA, Asamblea Nacional Ciudadana. And their motto was from protest to proposals. Uh, they organized around a 10-point uh, political agenda of reforms, and they've been pushing along for that. And meanwhile, politicians were discussing more or less the same topic, uh, political reform, in very rigid, structured, boring formats, <laughs> as you can see. The contrast was really strong when these political activists went into the street and uh, organize a lot of fun events. I mean, here you can see it's a, it's a cycling event where you had to keep the light, uh, a light bulb for 24 hours uh, on, and it was in the eve of the budget election, of the budget discussion. And it was very much a campaign called Ya Bajenle, reduce, reduce it, or reduce or lower the public funding of uh, political parties. So we were there cycling <laughs> most of the night, uh, keeping the light uh, on. 
Um, another event that happened as well was the Aventón Ciudadano. It was, and I put all the hashtags there, Aventón Ciudadano. This was very interesting. We, um, there were these activists that went around, around 35 uh, cities talking about this political reform in a hitchhiking, organized hitchhiking event. And so through Twitter and Facebook, you would um, see where they were, who would give them, who would give them a ride. And there were very interesting networks. I mean, somebody from Germany offered them a drive through her mother who was living in Coatzacoalcos. There are stories like this. But they, they really um, started this uh, discussion about political reforms and how to open the political system for citizen representation. President Calderon um, introduced a bill a few years ago and they discussed that there were really four points out of that bill that really wanted to be pushed. And they explained it, and this is like one of the photos they put, like, why do we need re-election of, of representatives? It's because we need professional legislators here, 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 as you can say. So these four points were the independent candidates, the referendum and plebiscites, the citizens' right to present initiatives in Congress, and the mayor and legislative re-election. Um, after many years of lobbying, and you can see the different tactics from getting a camp out, out of in, in the Senate and pushing it through the committees, the different re-elections, and we even had a, a huge important uh, vote seen through Ustream and through the, the Congress channel, and we were all Twittering uh, legislators who were they going to vote for and things like that, and press conference. Um, finally, three out of the four points were passed just last week. Um, obviously, the, <laughs> the, there are still very large obstacles. The, the thresholds for most of these uh, initiatives were really large, so it's going to be a really battle to get an initiative, a citizen initiative and, and plebiscite well done. And re-election still pending. And probably re-election is mo the mother of all the big reforms. But it's, it's, a, it's an important win it's for especially um, a small group of people who did this and who pass it and who convince parties to uh, vote in favor of this. Um, the rule of law reforms. This has been a huge issue, as you can imagine, and I'm pretty sure Beatriz knows a lot about this. Um, it's been going on for 10 years, and I think it'll take 10 more years. But um, we have civil uh, rights organizations and academics working along how to reform the justice system. And one of their success was this movie. I don't know if you, if you saw it, Presunto Culpable, Presumed Guilty. It really involved general society in what, how technical the issue were and how much injustice were, was done through the justice system. And something that's been happening as well is that the Supreme Court is so, so really engaging in historic rulings. For the first time, we have a more autonomous, independent Supreme Court, obviously it takes years, about 10 years, to have the Supreme Court rule on your case, on your behalf, and obviously there isn't that much time. But I think um, from the bottom in terms of, of due process and justice reform and on the top with the Supreme Court, something will change. There's also human rights organizations. I mean, here we have um, two very important sentences, well, three. One where organizations defended peasants. Uh, Teodoro Cabrera and Rodolfo Montiel were in prison about 12 years ago by military. And their case went all the way into the International Human, uh, the Inter-American Human Rights Court, as well as uh, Valentina Inés. They were um, indigenous women who were violated by military. And what their cases are so important because this First, inter-American human rights court sentences are being recognized by the Mexican state, which is very important. So it's not just about national justice, but it's also transnational or international justice. 
And also there has been a huge, last year, just a very important um, reform recognizing human rights as constitutional rights. So this will change dramatically the justice system. Um, and finally, this is probably the one you know. I mean, the whole victims movement led, given voice by uh, Javier Cecilia, this big march last year. Obviously, it was very important to say the victims is not really um, that we are part of the narcotraffic. We're really victims of this war. But I, I really like to um, talk a little bit about one important person in this movement. She's a nun in Monterrey. You won't, you won't probably know her, Sister Consuelo Morales, but she just received the Human Rights Watch Award last year. And what she's been leading really, it's the case of not only receiving and giving the voice of the victims, but also investigating um, their, their cases and their files in Monterrey. What happened last year when the march of, of Javier Cecilia arrived in Monterrey was they weren't really just in, in the public rally. They went into the Procuraduría office, in the general attorney's office, to ask what had happened to their cases, to their files. And so since then, every month they have met and hold a press conference, and I don't know if you see it, but it's, there's the general attorney there and there's the family holding the portraits of, of their victims and asking what has happened to those files and to those research. And I think uh, Sister Consuelo is very much linking this victims movement into building local capacity to investigate and to uh, try to do something on these files and especially try to reform the Procuradurías and the Ministerios Públicos in Monterrey. Um, the quality of education, this is large, hugely debate. I mean, I can give you hundreds of data about how bad the education is in Mexico. I can only tell you that uh, a fourth of, this, of the public budget is used for funding public education. 6% of GDP is spent in education. We have 100% of basic education coverage. However, children are not learning. And when you see like um, high school or even university students, they come with such a bad level of education and like where, I mean, where have they been? We've um, seen that it's really teachers being promoted by political loyalties of, to the Sente, to the union, teachers union, which is very political. There's a very high teacher's absenteeism everywhere. You go to a community and there's usually the teacher who's not there or is there two out of the five days that they need to be there. And there's a lot of impunity in the education system. And all this holds a very low quality of education. This, I mean, I think we've talked this for about 10 years or more. We know this, but I think for the first time, civil society is really trying to organize to deal with this case. Um, there's this movement, Muevete por la Educación, it's a citizens coalition and it has organized lots of discussions, academic discussions about what to reform first, but it also has taken it to activism and to bills in the Senate. And it's still a long way to go, but I think it's doing for the first time um, a first reform, which is about holding every teacher's promotion in a system of uh, civil service. And there's also, and currently this week, we have a big debate about how to hold universal uh, teachers evaluation. This is going to be really important in the next years. There's going to be a big battle between um, not really government and the union, but really civil society against the political um, alliance or, or complicity with the uh, authorities and centers. So this is going to be important. Um, fourthly, I'm just touching on this consumers reform. Obviously, we have big monopolies and nobody can touch them. A lot of the state regulation agencies have been captured and it's, it's really huge thing. We can't really, as consumers, I mean, I don't know if you, any, we hate Telcel and there's no way that you can change it. 
Uh, so this is really a movement that's been forming. Odio Telcel is the hashtag if you, can, if you want to use it. But something that has happened, it's um, the last two years, it's really recent, it's a consumer's reform movement and consumer's right. Uh, there hasn't been yet class action in Mexico. It was just approved uh, last year after a huge battle and with lots of uh, nuances, but for the first time we have class action in Mexico. And there's very recent new consumers organizations but I think they have a huge potential in mobilizing um, people against monopolies. And finally, this is also very new as well. Um, well, and you know the scandal about Walmart bribes, and I'm not going to talk about that, but the huge thing about Walmart bribes were really land zone use and the whole real estate, how it deals with uh, local government corruption. And so, um, small network of organizations. We've been forming the Red Mexicana por Ciudades Justas, Democráticas y Sustentables. It's a sustainable cities network where um, we're trying to really build along different cities a more accountability from local government and, and for citizens, for city planning and for um, better po public policies for cities. So hopefully until now I've talked to you about how important civil society is. However, is it strong enough? Because I've said that it's still emerging, it's really young, so can it deal with all these reforms that are so important for Mexico? Um, a few weaknesses that we have, but there are huge. There are limited resources. Most of the organizations, uh, reforms, that I've talked to you um, have international funding. Very few of them have local money or Mexican funding. Uh, there's very limited, if non, non strategic endogenous philanthropy, and I think that's really important to, to help grow civil society in Mexico and the strategic one. Uh, there's very limited human resources. A few of the political activists I talked to, they're kind of everywhere. It's a very small group, and we need to really grow that up. Um, and obviously, there's also so limited uh, organized resources for mobilizing large numbers of people. There are some demonstrations, one or two days, but then after that, not a lot of people mobilize. And in certain cases, it's very important the numbers of people that th these things move, um, for the politicians to really listen and, and to be accountable. And obviously the political adversaries like La Maestra, El Vester, I mean, or Slim are, are huge. I mean, they're strong, they're organized, they have unlimited resources. So the challenge ahead, it's, it's enormous. But, and obviously I can't really tell what the future is, it's really uncertain, but I think that it's, it's a very important bet to strengthen civil society. It's, it's doing a very important job Currently, it's very invisible. Nobody knows about all this, but I think it's really important for getting those reforms out. And otherwise, if we still keep this very small or um, weak <coughs> civil society, we'll still wait and 10 years or more. Where are we going to get economic reforms? So this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. We would like to um, go ahead and open it up for answer for a question and answer period, also to see if we get any e-questions. And um, I just would like to applaud all of you for each of your research and your projects. It's clear that the passion shows that you um, are very active and engaged in what you're doing, and um, so and your personal story was touching. So. Um, I, I, it's obvious that it translates into your work and your research and you know what you're doing to make change. Well, let's start with the audience and see if there's any questions. Yes, can we have a microphone down here, please? Uh, well, congratulations for the three of you. It's very impressive. And now we have to take the next step. And the next step is the 
the turmoil that is going to happen the 1st of July in Mexico. Mm. Is there going to be political will of whomever wins the elections to do all this reform? Let, let's, what we are sure for sure is that we don't know. That's, that's reality. Uh, Oportunidades is going to continue. We don't know. The reforms are going to, get to, to be done. We don't know. Uh, we don't know who is going to win, and we don't know nothing starting the next year uh, regarding these issues. So what is going to be the role of the social organizations, of the civil society, to produce these changes? It's, it is really possible or we are going to, to wait for another century? Mm -hmm. We are going to wait for another century? I don't know, <laughs> this is a great question. <laughs> um, I, li I like very much um, Julian Lebaron, one of these victims, activists, who has been really powerful. He has a saying like, we're always waiting for Quetzalcoatl, <laughs> you know? We want this savior, this messiah to come and do the reforms and help us and save us. And every time we wait for Quetzalcoatl, we get a Hernán Cortés who comes and <laughs> chops off the heads of everyone. <laughs> and I think I really like the story of how powerful symbols. And I, I think uh, we've learned that it's, we, we can't wait for Quetzalcoatl anymore. We have to do it ourselves. We have to be empowered enough um, and we have to convince a lot of people that we can do it, that it's, it's useless to wait for some saver or leader or whatever. I think we really need to organize, articulate. So um, I think when I changed that kind of bottom in my head, it was really important, like, okay, whoever wins in July, we're going to be the same. We're going to keep organizing, getting ourselves together, and, and articulating, I mean, no matter who comes in government, and I'm not expecting any leader to make these reforms, I'm expecting us to do them. Uh, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, like, I, well, while you were presenting, uh, I was, you know, like, coming up with uh, all sorts of ideas, and I really uh, sort of agree with you that you say that uh, we need to stop waiting for somebody else to come and save us, and really, you know, like, the core and the immune system of all societies is uh, the civil society, the private sector, social entrepreneurs, uh, nonprofits. We are here to stay. Mexico is our country. This is where our families are. And it's really our responsibility to, 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 to push for these reforms and to find solutions, regardless of uh, who's in power. And, you know, I can only uh, think of so many opportunities for us really to work together and, you know, like sort of from the social entrepreneurship perspective, really figure out ways of uh, channeling funding from small donations, from you know, like really sort of a, uh, local consumers that uh, really want to support these sort of uh, organizations. Because this is, you know, like the consumers that I work with, all these volunteers are the people that really want to change in the world through supporting a macro enterprise or through supporting a sort of a politi political movement or a reforestation. So these are the people that are gonna change the country and all we need to do is just uh, channel them. So all I see is really uh, hope and possibilities. Just a comment, I, I think that thinking about the topic I talked about, which is uh, in the design of the state and the limits of corruption and, and so on, there are things that make me very optimistic about, l let's say, Oportunidades, I think that's there to stay, the independence of the Banco Central, that's there to stay. And, and there are some reforms that have been very well conceived and in a, in a way blindadas, protected. Um, and I think that's one thing. The other is that federalism has its positive effects. Thinking about, let's say, Oaxaca, and what I talked about, the institutional innovation of allowing this you know, form of governance, and we could think of innovation in police reform happening in different cities. That I, I, I see you know, as, as a room for optimism. What I see very difficult is the the um, coordination of uh, some you know, security, uh, security policy. I think that their federalism is working against Mexico, um, and I, I find it very worrisome. I think that Mexico has a stronger challenge than, let's say, Colombia had, precisely because of this federal structure, and I really don't, don't see that that's easy to really disentangle it. 
So that's where I'm not optimistic, and I, that's where I chose not to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to add a comment, I know. Oh, a question, go ahead. There's a question from Monica, and, and also I think I'd appreciate uh, the perspective from Gabriela and Beatrice. I was wondering if there's any examples of um, local empowerment of community-based leaders um, leveraging the work of Oportunidades in, similar, in, a, in a way that Oshoka is empowering leaders um, in the NGO sector. Um, I think there's a great opportunity in Mexico if some of these emerging leaders in places like Chiapas and Oaxaca can get together and learn from each other. Um, I know in West Virginia, the nonprofit called Next Generation, and they bring um, community leaders from throughout the um, developing world, but it would be interesting to see if yeah. there's some of this thinking going on in Mexico. I think Oportunidades was uh, designed and is implemented with very little participation, although the vocales are very local leaders, but they they, they don't have much power or capacity to do m much more than just um, get the women out and do whatever the program is expecting out of them. And there was certain effort of bringing certain grassroots organizations into providing a, a greater bundle of benefits to oportunidades, but that was very much cut up, I think six years ago, more or less when the government changed. And, and since then, I think Oportunidades, it's, it's very much at the local level, but it doesn't scale up for participation, leadership, and, um, and it's, it's very linked to bureaucracy and to uh, municipalities in Oaxaca when they're small, but if, if, if you go to a, a bigger municipalities, you wouldn't see Oportunidades as, as uh, important as bringing participation into the municipality or, or, or um, I think where I was going with this, I think there's just, an opportunity for philanthropic support. Yes. Because I think there's limits for opportunity guys, but I think that uh, through yes. philanthropy, there may be a way to empower some of these local leaders to, um, to be able to take their leadership to the next level. Mm -hmm. so, so I slightly disagree with your evaluation. I think that um, the, the study that we have you know, both for the case of Oaxaca and Chiapas, but again, we're studying the poorest communities. And, and, and that I think it's, it's great because that's where I want to start to have, you know, sort of, where that program wanted to begin to have an impact. So the studies that we have suggest, for example, that in the, um, the Usos municipalities, when we ask women, do you, you know, do you, because there is always been discrimination in terms of who can, perform the important cargos in the communities and so on. And that's always the problem with these traditions. No? And one of the fascinating results is that, oh yes, we've been participating. You know, we already do this through opportunities and then from there, we're starting to do this other cargo. And so <coughs> this change is sinking in the women's self-esteem and women's realization of their you know, power is very slow. I mean, Chiapas is a different story. Oaxaca is going faster. Chiapas is progressing slow, although you had the 3,000 women you know, going at the, at the doorstep. I mean, that was huge for San Juan Chamula. So I, I, I disagree. I think that the, the, um, the program is obviously linked to bureaucracy, mm -hmm. but that's what has been required to transform the social structure. I don't think that there is the intent to politicize this in another way, because the program has been really sort of trying to keep it independent from politics. So the first thing they tell you, you are not linked to any political party, you receive your venue. So they are having really trying to not politicize it. And the, the person I really learned a lot from is the San Juan Chamula, he's from San Juan Chamula, he speaks at Tzotzil, and he's the program coordinator in 18 municipalities, administering the program from 100,000 you know, people. And so we are not supposed to you know, sort of give information about politics, but he said to me personally, he said, we really should be you know, teaching women about their rights and about how to, you know, because this community, and he was referring to Chamula, it's a priesta community, they're always going to be priesta, so they, they really have to learn more about their rights. So there has been so much emphasis in depoliticizing this that I don't think that that would be, you know, that's the reason that it might not have been done, what you are asking, yes. Yes. Just 
Um, this lady had a question right there. Can we bring the microphone and then we'll get yours next. Thank you. Um, uh, you have been, you guys have been in the whole Mexico, but um, here in the United States, when they say Mexico, they think like Mexico is the same, and you guys know that the North and the South and the East and the West. So regarding this Francesco uh, question, how do you see the community empowerment? So how do you see the difference between North and South and the, you know, next to the ocean? So maybe it's open to the panel. Would you like to start, Gabriela? Yeah, so I work in the sort of central west coast of Mexico in the states of uh, Guanajuato, Colima, Michoacán, uh, Jalisco, and the Huascalientes. And it's, um, I believe it's one of the most productive areas in the country in terms of uh, micro entrepreneurs and in terms of uh, small, medium enterprises. And uh, we, we basically work there because, because of uh, sort of uh, this uh, micro entrepreneurship participation. And since we are not too poor and not too close to the United States, we didn't really have the sort of the, the, the short-term option of uh, just leaving. Although Jalisco, for instance, is a um, highly uh, immigrant state, there are still uh, sort of a, all the infrastructure. The, there's still the circumstances for people just to you know like to be there and figure out okay, what do we do? This is a, again to start thinking about more long-term about uh, the states. This is our house. We need to do something. So to that extent. Um, Sort of in this area, in the center west of Mexico, there's more entrepreneurship, there's more uh, small medium enterprises, and I believe this is where we should start, you know, to sort of resegmenting the market and focus on uh, social innovation and civil society participation, because this is where, uh, and this is where I grew up, and this is where we all are very aware that we have no other opportunities. Either we improve the country, either we make sure that uh, our institutions are designed for the long term, or, or we won't have options. So in the, the north, and probably, you know, I'll let you guys uh, tell about the other differences. In the north, it's easier to say, you know, like, you know what, this is not working, let's go to the U.S. Even uh, sort of less and less and less because there are less opportunities, but uh, it's easier just not to be that engaged. I don't think that's happening in the, in the center of Mexico. Beatriz, did you want to add something, or, or Monica? Do you want to go first? Um, yes. I see a lot of differences in civil society. I mean, that's really my, my work. Um, I, th I think in, in several states, there's a very um, fragile or absent civil society organizations and participation. Um, and in other states like um, Chihuahua, uh, Baja California, Jalisco, and obviously Oaxaca and Chiapas, but that has to do more with community organ I mean, community traditional organization and, and uh, even agrarian organizations. So it's really different. Uh, also, for me, a, a very important thing that I, uh, every time I go to a certain region, I, I want to find out is how um, business is civically engaged with civil society, because that, that's also a very important difference between if there's a good philanthropy and there's resources for civil society um, to engage or not. And for example, Chihuahua, it's really amazing, a certain foundations that's there. And that changes the whole, um, the whole region in, in those terms. Um, El Estado de Mexico, for example, has none civil society and it's amazing. It's just like you're in the city and you kind of cross the metropolitan area and you're like, in the middle of nowhere in terms of, of civil societies is very low, densely uh, organized. So that's... Um. Just a very short comment. So talking about the indigenous, no, sort, sort of... So I'm very interested in extreme poverty and I wish I had you know, shown a map. If you look at the map of poverty, extreme poverty, and you look at indigenous um, language or identity, it's highly correlated, no? And so it's really dense in the South. So this is, you know, one big reason to study Oaxaca, Chiapas, Yucatan, you know, parts of Puebla and so on. And, and, and here, there are very huge differences between, between, let's say, Oaxaca and Chiapas. You know, I just was there a week ago. We were training 20 uh, um, students who are helping us collect uh, ethnographic anthropological work in different communities. 10 of them came from Oaxaca and 10 from Chiapas. 
And uh, we spent a week together and they were telling us experiences from their community, how much they knew about the assemblies, and it was really day and night. I mean, unbelievable difference. We had had this experience before because we'd done the work in Oaxaca and I was thinking maybe we got it wrong. I mean, there was some, so I was surprised. And let me begin, the story began because our, we took our kids to learn how to weave uh, into the Tlán del Valle. We wanted them to learn how to weave these very beautiful um, carp, um, tapetes. And, uh, and we met with this uh, man whose name is Demetrio. And we, we spent a week with him and, and you know, his Zapotec and every day we talk, he knew about FISM, he knew about federal transfers, he knew so much about, you know, the, you know, what was going on in the community that we thought, I mean, is this the metro or is this something more systematic about Oaxaca? So we made this survey in part because the metro inspired us. So we found really, you know, part of the data that I found is, you know, the metro seems not to be that huge of an exception, although he's a special, no man, because he's selling his, his product in New York and in London, I mean, he's quite impressive, no? But anyway, and then you go to Chiapas and this, uh, it's tremendous disempowerment. It's a very caciquil structure. The political parties has, are on top of the, you know, of the community and are really not helping the communities. They're really extracting, uh, you know, capturing the resources. Very different story. Um, uh, you know, with similar traditions, no? Um, and Chiapas is the, you know, very conflictual state, remains very conflictual, uh, religious divisions that are very profound, very violent. So just between these two states is huge. But I, you know, began interested in this like 20, you know, not so much, 15 years ago, and I still have this as a, you know, what a puzzling difference between two states that appear very similar. And um, so the next one, you know, Yucatan, with, you know, similar presence of Mayan. So, so the stories are very, very different. I know this seems sort of alien because it's really very different types of community, but I bet that if you similarly study the stories of, you know, Tijuana versus Chihuahua, and the, you know, the story of, they're really, that, that's what really we need to go and learn. That's what I think. So I'm becoming an anthropologist at this time. <laughs> there was another yeah. question on this side. Um, I just wanted to continue the discussion about Oaxaca and Chiapas. Um, I worked in Chiapas for 10 years and I've been working in Oaxaca for 28 years in Zapoteco and Mixteco communities and also with um, indigenous immigrants in the, the West Coast. Um, and I think it's very, it's very interesting. I really appreciate bringing in of civil society and social movements. Um, and I, I don't know, but I think many, many people who have spoken today, some people have worked throughout Mexico, but many people had their formación in Mexico City. Um, and then changed as they uh, maybe went to other places. And a lot of the categories that we're hearing today, if we invited leaders from Oaxaca and Chiapas, yes. we would be hearing uh, terms like autonomia. Yes. Uh, we would be yes. hearing usos y costumbres and tequio, social responsibility. That's right. We would be hearing derechos colectivos y derechos individuales, collective rights and individual rights. So. I, I appreciate very much uh, some of the points that Beatrice made, which is that in indigenous communities, many of these ideas that we've been talking about in terms of investing in your community, transparency, being socially accountable, yes. they've been ongoing processes oh, um, for a very long time. So I'm really uh, happy to see those introduced. And I think that even in Oaxaca and Chiapas, there are tremendous differences. Um, on December 31st, 1993, 30% of the Zapatista bases that went and went into communities were women. That was also revolutionary. Yes. Uh, in Oaxaca in 2006, a very broad-based movement, not just the APO, but many other organizations, essentially prevented the state government from operating and women were very involved. They took over public media. They broadcast in many different languages. So I think there are other ways in which social movements uh, have also laid out uh, important uh, information and they have laid out imprints on many, many people, especially young people. How do you see uh, the role of these movements, not so much in the street, uh, but in the daily fabric 
uh, of life. How do you see the rest of Mexico learning from these experiences? Is that, is that possible? And is it possible to take this other language of yes. autonomía, uh, of usos y costumbres, of take your responsibilidad social, derechos colectivos, is it possible to send that back you know, to other parts of Mexico? Thank you for your, your comment. And I think that part of the goal of this big research project that we have is precisely what you are saying. I mean, I'm learning so much from this um, you know, form of civil society, social capital, in it, and I don't think that this is sufficiently known, and it has not been sufficiently well communicated in a way because of you know, ideology, this liberal, the, the notion of you know, we have liberal rights and it's completely against you know, community rights and autonomies. But part of the, I think the findings that we have thus far is twofold. One is that, that it's really important to talk about autonomy. So you know, the differences in Chiapas and Oaxaca you know, in part are explained by the fact that USOS really allows for more autonomy, I think. One, I mean, that's a huge one. And then the other is the conflict resolution aspect that I didn't go uh, in detail. So we have really fascinating findings in terms of crime rates, for example, communities that are at very similar level, poor communities in, in Oaxaca. Similar structures, you have usos in one and there is significantly less crime. And I think I've been, you know, I'm fascinated by this idea of more efficient oral ways of conflict resolution that do not involve the judicial power and the, you know, the whole structure that it doesn't work. So I think that this needs to be better communicated to outside of these regions. And I think we have a lot to learn from, from those. That's, that's in part the goal of our, our project. Thank you so much. I wish yes. we had more time yes. because I know everybody has questions. Gabriela, Beatriz, and Monica, thank you so much for your efforts and for thank sharing you. that with us. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Yes. <laughs>
and some 50 research projects. It's a, it's a tiring affair, a, a little bit like Lewis Carroll's Red Queen. You have to run all the time to basically stay in the same place. But it's wonderful because uh, I get to support these young minds from Mexico, very often young minds that wouldn't have an opportunity or a possibility of growing and developing and, and, and uh, uh, growing intellectually if, uh, if we didn't have programs like UC Mexus and like Conacyt in Mexico that is working with us to support uh, these students. And the rest of my work, I'm, I'm a field biologist. I do a lot of work in Mexico, especially in Baja California, the Sea of Cortez. Um, doing field work and uh, field exploration. So I always joke uh, two things. First of all, I basically get paid to do things that most people would be willing to pay large amounts of money to do. Uh, so in that sense, I have the best job in the world, really. And also, if you think, what is it that most of us academics, and in particular in my job I do, I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm a peddler of hope. Uh, we support young, young minds that are full of hope and ideas of what to do in the future and how to change their society and how to make Mexico move forward and progress. And also, of course, in conservation, if you work in conservation science, you're also visiting wonderful places and wonderful communities and rural communities of people that want to preserve their forests or their reef or their fishing community. And they're actually looking forward to the preservation of the environment for their, for their children and their offspring. So really, uh, the work we do in conservation biology, I would, I would refer to it as the geography of hope. We basically work trying to promote a hopeful future. And I say this because a lot of what we heard today was about the same thing. Uh, a lot of these wonderful uh, projects, uh, that, that uh, we heard today, uh, Margarita, Francesco, uh, the three last uh, presentations, uh, Gabriela, Beatriz, Monica, and, and all the others, everybody today, it's, uh, you know, there are so many things being done in Mexico by people that actually want a better country, want a better society, and want to make things uh, improve. And I couldn't sort of uh, resist the, 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 the temptation of related to something that is a present I, I brought for Alberto, which is this book we have just printed. It's called Mexico at the Hour of Combat. And it's basically a series of photographs that we were able to uh, preserve, protect, and restore in, uh, in the archives of the University of California about the, uh, this is the Sabino Osuna collection. Sabino Osuna was a photographer in Mexico City in 1913 during uh, the Decena Tragica, the, the uprising against Madero and the usurpation of government by, by Huerta. And he photographed all these events of the Mexican Revolution in Mexico City. And I have five books, by the way, but I'm going to give you the five so you can give them away. If any of you wants a book, you bribe Alberto and you'll get a copy. <laughs> They're really amazing photographs, amazing photographs. But what I find really interesting about that book, and I, I really would like some of you to see it, is basically what Sabino Suna was photographing was the city where people were trying to maintain their, their life. You know, selling tacos on the street, um, maintaining the markets, operating, uh, taking care of their children, whatever, while, while the city around them and, and reality around them was falling to pieces, was uh, society was, was changing in an irreversible manner. And, um, that I find incredibly, incredibly interesting uh, of how people, how all of us tend to maintain our own environments and, and our own dreams and our own desire for a better place, even when we are absolutely surrounding, uh, so surrounded by, by, by social collapse or by, by violence, which leads me again to this idea of the cultivation of hope as, as a manner of, of uh, survival. And these have been the driving themes I kept getting today as I was, I was uh, listening to all, to all the, the presentations. Another thing that came out really loud and clear, and for us who have done field work in Mexico, this is a very important, is the importance of community. Uh, Mexico is basically a country of communities. Luis Gonzalez y Gonzalez wrote uh, some years ago a, a paper in the journal Nexus, I think it was 1980, 1981, that was called Suave Matria. I can't translate that, but uh, it was a beautiful paper in which he basically, his, his thesis was 
the idea of a fatherland is, is, is a sort of male idea, a phallocratic idea, but Mexicans really respond to their motherland, to the place where they're born, to the place where they live, and to their community. The sense of community is really what drives the country. And I think this is what many of the presentations we heard today are all about, how to move a country that is organized around local cultures and communities and the respect of different, of diversity. It's a hugely diverse country with a huge number of different local country, uh, local cultures that respect each other and that communicate with, with each other. And I think this is one of the big challenges, the unresolved challenges we have in Mexico nowadays. And let me land this to one example in which I have become really, really involved in the last years. I mentioned this during last year passingly, and pre will be still on for a few years more, which is what we can call the fight for Cabo Pulmo. And uh, which is in many ways similar to the fight for the Supervia or many other uh, uh, really difficult discussions we have embarked. Cabo Pulmo is a wonderful community in Baja California where the fishermen in that community evolved from being pearl fishers in the 1930s until all the pearls disappeared. Then they started fishing from the 1930s to the 1960s until all the fish was gone. And then in the 1970s, they started worrying about what to do. And some of them learned to dive with, with scuba gear. I started taking people to their sea and they realized that if they protected their environment, they could make more money than if they kept on degrading the environment. So in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s, they worked with Luis Donaldo Colosio, and I had the opportunity of working with them at that time to make their area a, a marine park, a national park. And as a matter of fact, it's been the most successful park in the world. We have no records of any other marine park recovering so much as this park. You go now to Cabo Pulmon, it's the best place for fish observation, for marine life observation in the world. And the reason why I call this a conflict is because, of course, now there is a huge project to develop 30,000 hotel rooms at the side of Cabo Pulmo, uh, promoted by, by a Spanish company. And, of course, we have opposed this, environmentalists have opposed this, in, in a tremendous way. We have been really, really strong about it. Because there is no way you can preserve a reef of that richness with 30,000 hotels. Just to give you a, an idea of the magnitude of this proposal, the whole of Baja California Sur nowadays are 15,000 hotel rooms. So in one side, they want to build a whole city. 30,000 hotel rooms implies a, a city of around 150,000 people to just provide services for that, for that type or that size of development. And of course, the community, the local community are completely opposed to because they see this as something that was going to rip their social fabric. And uh, they, are, they, are, they are incredibly intensely against it. And we have discussed this over and over with governmental officers. And very much to my surprise, what I find is that governmental officers ask me, why do you oppose this? This is progress. We're going to have big hotels. This is good for Mexico. This is going to bring investment. And they simply cannot understand very often. You get officers high in government. They cannot understand the importance of community, concepts that are for anyone working in the field like me, like everyday concept, the force of communities, the sense of place, the attachment to an area, the ability to think in the long term, the ability and the capacity to think about our children and to th think about the future and to think about a prosperous and vibrant future, that doesn't ring in the bell of many decision makers. And we have this in many other examples in Mexico. It's happening all the time. All these hopeful examples like the ones we saw today that are cropping up all over the country are at the same time examples, all the mega mineria projects that we're seeing, mega mining, uh, that we, we've already have a few going and they're really catastrophic. The, the permits to rip off the earth, dig in 200 meters deep and extract uh, gold with, with cyanide and, and, uh, and mercury amalgam that leaves behind a polluted environment that will stay polluted for at least thousands, many thousands of, uh, of years. And I think these two contracts, uh, contrasts, what country do we want? 
uh, what, what do we want for the future? What would, do we want for our children? Is really what is at the bottom of many of the discussions we had today. And one of the reasons why I celebrated so much the presentations today that are so strongly linked in the ability to think about community, to think about social integration. I really liked what uh, Gabriela Enrique said. She mentioned, uh, I'm quoting by memory because I didn't jot it down on the, on the slide one pass, but she said, we need harmony and we need belonging, we, not, we do not need simply growth. Growth alone will not do it. Economic growth will not resolve what we need. We need a more prosperous society. And I would, I would like to say that perhaps what she was talking about is, and these are my words, but I want to interpret that because I thought that was a very, very powerful concept, a civilization and a prosperity that may match the immense richness of the Mexican landscape and the immense richness of the Mexican culture and the immense richness of the Mexican nature. This, this is the big challenge that we have in front of us. And this is, in my perspective, the only way that Mexico will move forward. And this is why I celebrate so much the presentations I had today, because they really are making an effort to think outside the box, think in an innovative way about this, these big challenges. Thank you very much. And I would now like to have Alberto Diaz Calleros, the director of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies here at UCSD and your host of this great event. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm not sure what to say after following, you know, all, all the people that we've listened to today. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, the, 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 the idea at this, at this stage was to think a little bit, um, I thought I would spell out a little bit the logic of what we have done through the day, because in a way we, we've, you know, gone through different sessions, and each session has been quite different. Each presentation has been quite different. Um, and, and it's hard to do it, because there's, there's been enormous richness, even, uh, you know, even though I knew who the players were, and I knew more or less what to expect out of their presentations, there were so many unexpected, but incredibly, you know, insightful ideas that came out through, through their presentations, as we were also listening to people's questions and how they addressed the questions or they addressed each other. Um, but, but let me try to just, you know, remind you a little bit of the exercise we did in the day, and hopefully, you know, I'll be brief and, 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 and get us, you know, thinking about how all fits together even if it doesn't. Um, so, 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 so the way the program was organized is we, we really started motivated by this question of, of growth, you know, sort of uh, why, why Mexico is enriched, you know, this question of, in a way, we, we thought about, okay, and in the end, the deep causes, the deep, deep, deep reasons why Mexico is not in the development trajectory that many of us would like. And, um, and, and when we think about this, I mean, Mexico has undoubtedly grown. People are more prosperous today than they were 20 years ago. Um, and the other thing, you know, I think clearly from, from Gordon's, you know, account, what, what he was telling us is, I, I think, as, I mean, he didn't say this, but he didn't, he, he kind of suggested, don't, don't aspire to be Brazil. Uh, and maybe it's very hard to think that we can aspire to be Korea, but, but maybe in the end we have to aspire to be Mexico. Uh, and that's not exactly what he said, but, you know, but that's, you know, one of the ways I, I read, you know, a lot of, of what his, of what his uh, uh, you know, account was. Um, Santiago Levy, on the other hand, you know, he, he, he has really, you know, written quite extensively about this whole diagnosis about, you know, the way in which we have a dysfunctional system of social protection, how we have problems, you know, handicaps in the formation of human capital, this informal economy, the questions of the regulatory framework, you know, that moves and pushes companies into informality. We, we kind of, we have that diagnosis. Uh, but in the end, he came here and told us we need a new social pact. We need to rethink the way in which citizens, in which people see the services they get, see the communities they belong to, and how those communities get organized uh, to give them, uh, you know, through, 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 through public services, how they, you know, they will be able to contribute. So that was, you know, he talked about taxation, but, you know, stripped away from this, you know, very technocratic language, if you want, it, it was about how do you contribute and what do you get back. Uh, I think as, as we went into this session, which I had called basic needs, um, this session was inspired a little bit in the idea that it's in, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, that everyone has a right to a standard of living that is adequate for health and the well-being of himself and his family. I would probably amend herself, himself, and her family, uh, including food, clothing, housing, 
basic medical care and the necessary so social services, and we kind of zeroed in on the question of housing. Um, as we were thinking about housing, I, I think the, the question was not really housing. It was how do we create, I, I think it's an architecture. Yeah, and it, it's not just, you know, it's, it's, it's this architecture at the same level in some ways when we saw those houses built with adobe or bamboo as the ones that were built by Legorreta in Dubai. You know, we're, we're talking about this architecture that at whichever scale, for the rich or for the poor, you know, for, you know, huge or small, creates a sustainable community. Uh, I think that, that was part of, of the undertone of what we're talking about. Better towns and better cities, because we will be living together. We will be living in these towns and cities, um, but we, we have to, to build those sustainable spaces uh, to live in. The, the, la the third session um, was meant to think a little bit about how do you, I had thought it was about how do you do business when your clients are primarily people who do not have a lot of purchasing power, when you build a business around buying and selling and lending to the poor. Um, in the end, I, I, think, I think we got more than what, than what I was expecting from that session. In, in, in some sense, we, 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 you know, we, we, we understood, for example, how you can think you know, out of a product, tortillas. You know, if there's a signature product, you know, we're talking about sort of Mexican culture, how can that product become a global enterprise? And how can you even change the tastes and the way in which people consume that product uh, and create this world-class company out of that with a signature which is Mexican? And, and, and I think that's, that was just remarkable to think about this problem. But then starting to think of also a signature of, you know, when I think about Compartamos and about, about Francesco's story of, 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 of how do you create a bank that is not going to do the things Grameen and Yunus did, and is not going to do the things that, you know, Rakyat in Indonesia did. So suddenly, it's a bank that is specifically Mexican in some ways because of the challenges I think they had, their origin, the way they had to come together. And then they uh, kind of figure out, oh, there's an IPO I can do in New York. And I mean, that, that whole story maybe couldn't have happened elsewhere. I, I think, and now it's being exported as a global enterprise. And, and the same thing, finally, you know, when you think about this idea of building a community. I mean, the, the enormous, after what we've learned today, the enormous challenge that Casas Geo has placed itself. I mean, the bar, if we put the bar, look, think at the bar they have placed themselves of what they're going to build. They're going to build these places that any of us would like to live in. Uh, and, and, and I think this is remarkable. And again, I, I think it is a tribute to, to the way kind of Mexican culture, we want to live in, in places that, that we feel happy at. And, and, and I think that's, that's in keeping. The final session, um, we had called it building capabilities. Uh, there's a very specific reason why we chose that word. This comes from Amartya Sen's work on, 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 on poverty, where he, where he wanted us to shift the emphasis away from the question of how do we increase income to, to the issue of assessing the real freedoms or the own freedoms in his, in his words that people may have to develop an, uh, the ability to transform the resources they have into valuable activities that may, that may help them achieve happiness. And, and Sen actually talks about it in terms of happiness, not, not uh, and, and when we think about this is, you know, it was about the question of the distribution of opportunities, the, 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 the way in which those opportunities, how societies get organized to generate some of those opportunities. Uh, but I want to say something which to me was a great surprise. All of them, uh, all of our panelists, and maybe it was because they were women, and I don't want it to sound as a sexist comment, talked about their experience, their growing up, their, their, their things they had seen and witnessed. All of them had this, this very personal touch in the way they thought about this. It was an empathy with the issues that they were going to deal with. And, and, and you know, be it about the way civil society has grown together and become more organized, or about how do you build capacity and the kind of reforms and the sort of the, the mapping of, of those reforms, or how do you, you know, come with some you know, sense of compassion to the poor and then one day realize I can do something about this uh, as, as you're growing up, uh, or finally thinking about how the state is, is part of the problem, but it's also part of the solution, and it has to be some kind of partnership. I, I think all of these things, we discuss them in the context of an enormous empathy, uh, and, and I think that was, that was very important. So again, I want to thank you all for, for being here with us. I think we've learned an enormous amount, and uh, we really want to you know, keep on 
finding ways to convey all these ideas, to project them, uh, to synthesize them, and to also do scholarship around all the, you know, all the big puzzles, I think, that have been pointed to us as scholars uh, as our challenges to, to, to work on. Thank you. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Peter Cowie from the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, who made a great effort to be here. I understand you just made it from China, just literally got here, so thank you. Well, let me begin with uh, an apology, which is I did just get here from China. Uh, I certainly did not want to miss this event. Um, but I was part of the uh, U.S. Uh, delegation engaged in the negotiations in China that you've been reading about in the last few days. Um, that experience um, reminded me of something that uh, as a dean, and a dean particularly of a school devoted to the notion that the Pacific will be the center of the 21st century and that the interaction of the Americas and Asia will be the epicenter of global dynamics, that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, as we sat in negotiations in Beijing as the political drama uh, involving uh, Chen Guangzheng uh, unfolded around us, uh, we did something which experienced international negotiators always do. We put ourselves in a bubble. The crisis didn't exist. We were doing our work. And in a sense, as a great research university, uh, we put ourselves in a bubble. We undertake our research. We do our teaching. We provide our community service on the terms that we are familiar with. But there is certainly for a school like ours uh, a fundamental duty to go outside the bubble and to engage deeply and broadly around some core aspects of this specific century. And if you're in San Diego, and if you're in the state of California, and if you're looking towards the Pacific, clearly the engagement with Mexico requires us to go outside the bubble in a deep and profound way. The Center for U.S.-Mexico Studies used to be an independent organized research unit here at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and at one point, the school stepped forward and said, let it become part of the school and our family at the school while serving the campus as a whole because we have a passion for the commitment of the center and we will work to make it a success. Part of that commitment is Mexico moving forward as a way of making sure that we stay outside the bubble and remember that obligation. So you've lived through something that is part of what I hope will be always seen as the DNA of the school and of the center. Even in the short time that I was able to be here this afternoon, I was struck by the fact that as we evolve as societies, we invent new institutions. In the United States, the growth of a national economy, uh, a transformation to an urban society, and a knowledge economy led to many types of new institutions. The great foundations in an earlier era, Rockefeller and Ford, today Gates. The rise of the research university itself as a center for organizing society and the economy. These experiments take place because governments can't do everything that is essential for holding together the prosperity and the hopes of our societies. They need these experiments and inventions in our societies to complement them. And what we were hearing in this last panel and in the program that Alberto was just so precisely and brilliantly describing was a series of inventions that are going on in Mexico about how to deal with these just deep, deep challenges and opportunities. And the thing that is important about the rise of phenomena like social entrepreneurs and all the variety of organizations is that we're seeing a new type of institution designed to bring together the logic of the marketplace 
and the logic of social commitment and public responsibility in a whole new way. And that in itself changes the dimension and the space that government operates in because it has a new partner operating in a new way. And here's the last point I'd just make about this, which is in the United States, uh, we often have in the back of our head this idea that, ah, they're getting the point now, right? They're sort of doing what we're going to do. And I, sometimes that's right. I mean, we just heard in the last session, one of the problems for civil society in Mexico is that the tradition of great independent foundations doesn't exist to provide the types of resources and flexibilities for innovations that the foundations do in the United States. But I think that we were also hearing in the last session that in fact Mexico is experimenting and creating, as are other countries throughout the Americas, new types of social organizations that are trailblazers and have an important implication for what we do with the business of a, the United States in the future. Who really thinks that we're going to deal with our own problems of education or health for the people of lower income unless we invent new types of organizations and institutions to complement the obligations of government? And so in the longer term, Mexico moving forward is not just about understanding the relationship between the United States and Mexico and the dynamics of Mexico and immersing ourselves in a way that escapes the bubble. It's about teaching the United States about the experiments in Mexico so that we as a country can be stronger and wiser as well. And for that, as a dean, I'm very grateful to Alberto and his leadership at the center, to Gordon Hansen as a collaborator in this, and to all the people who have worked to make this possible. And I hope that you will join us in all the years to come in our work in this area. Thank you very much.